police and I'm with the uh, Minnesota Commemorative Task Force on the Civil War. And I'll be uh, your moderator today along with uh, John of the program. And uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, uh, start by, uh, uh, by recognizing our honored guests that are here today. And they include uh, Ann Toplovich of the uh, Tennessee Historical Society. Uh, Jim McKay is going to be speaking today on behalf of the Battle of Nashville Preservation Society. We have uh, the Honorable Representative Dean Erdahl from uh, Minnesota, one of the co-chairs of the uh, Minnesota Sesquicentennial Commemorative Task Force, uh, will be speaking. And uh, we also have Representative uh, Steve McDaniels, I think, with us here today. Steve, are you here somewhere? Steve's over there, big supporter of the Civil War, so we're so pleased to have him. So we welcome uh, them and uh, all the other members of the Battle of Nashville Preservation Society, members of the uh, Civil War Task Force from Minnesota that are here today, all the guests that came on the tour, and all you uh, wonderful Nashville Nashvillians that came out and uh, weathered this uh, the weather to be with us here today. Uh, I like to, and I am a member, as I said, of the Civil War uh, Commemorative Task Force here. Uh, uh, part of it that's called the Social Soldier Recognition uh, Committee. I'm also a member of the Battle of Nashville Preservation Society and have been for several years. And back in 1999, I had the privilege of uh, uh, speaking here to the Battle of Nashville Preservation Society, and I spoke about uh, Minnesota in the uh, uh, Civil War and. Uh, uh, made some comments about them, a couple of them that I'd like to uh, reiterate just to give you some perspective. Uh, as most of you know, Minnesota was uh, uh, one of the last states to come into the Union before the Civil War in 1858. It only had 175,000 citizens and it supplied about 20,000 soldiers to the uh, Civil War effort. And although it only had 11 uh, regiments in the war, as you know, Minnesotans uh, uh, performed quite famously at Bull Run, Shiloh, Corinth, Antietam, Gettysburg, Vicksburg, Chickamauga, on the Red River, and of course here at Nashville. Uh, and so I just want to make a comment a little bit about who were these men of the uh, Minnesota regiments. And uh, my familiarity is both with the, most with the 10th Minnesota, but uh, Minnesota had four regiments here, the 5th, 7th, 9th, and 10th in the battle, and of those uh, regiments, 27 of the 40 companies uh, were men from southern Minnesota, mainly uh, the, the regiment which had about a thousand men was composed of 740 of the men were farmers and 120 of them were laborers, so well over 800 of the men were frontiersmen who lived uh, lived on the frontier, uh, and, uh, uh, and also a lot of the men were uh, uh, while they were frontiersmen, we had a lot of uh, uh, immigrants in the regiments also from Ireland, Canada, Germany. And since it was Minnesota, we also had a lot of men from Scandinavia, so which you, you can imagine. But most of the men were men from the uh, mid-Atlantic and eastern states that came there as adventurers uh, for land. Uh, at that time in Minnesota, in the early enlistments, the average age of a Civil War soldier was 24 years of age. The average age of a Minnesota soldier was 21. And uh, so they were living on the frontier. There were men in, that were in great shape that could scale a mountain like this this one right here. Uh, I remember the story of one of the soldiers, Austin Carroll, that died here. Uh, when he enlisted in the uh, Army, he walked from what was my hometown of Plainview, Minnesota, to Fort Snelling, which was a distance of 100 miles. He walked 100 miles there with two of his friends and 100 miles back uh, to enlist. Uh, some of these regiments that fought here have in their records, uh, it says that they, they uh, traveled over 10,000 miles uh, in the war. Uh, just before coming to Nashville, those four regiments uh, were uh, fighting uh, in Missouri and Arkansas. They uh, were chasing a cavalry corps. They marched on foot from Little Rock, uh, the length of Arkansas and Missouri. They then marched all the way to the Kansas line and back to St. Louis, a distance of 750 miles. So you can imagine what kind of a sh shape they may have been in uh, to fight here. Also, uh, 
like I say, they were frontiersmen, they were great marksmen. Um, in the war, in the Union Army, there was a famous group of sharpshooters called Burdan's Sharpshooters. And uh, it was two, uh, two regiments of those men, and there were only four states that supplied two companies to Burdan Sharpshooters, and the only western state was uh, Minnesota. My personal interest in Nashville and the Civil War comes to the fact that my great-grandfather, James Foster, <clears throat> who was one of those Minnesotans, if you look at his picture, he's a lanky man. Him and his brother, Zelotus, fought here at Nashville. Zelotus was one of only four guys in the Union Army with that name, wherever the name came from. But uh, anyways, my, my ancestors fought here also. Uh, my hometown is Plainview, Minnesota, and from Plainview, came only one company of men in the Civil War. That was Company C of the 10th Minnesota. Uh, the 10th Minnesota in uh, MacArthur's Charge on Shies Hill here. The 10th Minnesota was on the extreme left of the brigade that made the charge. On the extreme left of the 10th Minnesota was Company C. <clears throat> that was from uh, my hometown area. And in that charge, seven of those men were killed uh, in the charge. So. Uh, that's a very personal part of the, uh, uh, the war for me. Uh, I'd like to speak just a moment about uh, the genesis of the, uh, the uh, marker that's here. And uh, as I said, I, I'm the chairman of a group called the Soldier Recognition Subcommittee of the Task Force. And one of the things we've been doing with that is not only to recognize battles and the great events of the Civil War, but more so to recognize the soldiers themselves that fought in the war. So one of the things we found out through some research a few years ago of all the men that fought from Minnesota, of those men that were killed or mortally wounded in the war, there were only 20 soldiers that were returned to Minnesota for burial. So on the anniversary of their those battles and when they were killed, we've been holding ceremonies uh, at 50, 16 different places uh, in the state. and. Uh, the Civil War pageantry and talking about the battle. And uh, 16 of those men we've gotten totally new markers for, much as we did here, because some of them in 150 years never had uh, a marker to uh, uh, honor their place where they fought in the war. Uh, one other thing I want to say about Company C is that uh, the, uh, the inscription that we put on the, on the stone uh, when we were was looking for something to get some years ago, I found this beautiful piece of prose w written by a soldier, and it took me several years to find out who he was, but turns out he was a private in Company C, that same company I mentioned that uh, uh, had the most men killed in the company that went up the hill. His name was Private John Milton Benton Hall. He was a, uh, uh, a private, but he, he wrote a very eloquent piece of uh, uh, that, that we put on the stone, and I want to read that for you because it's covered up now, and some of you may not get up the hill to talk about it, but what he said that we put on the stone is the following, and I quote, Comrades who month after month have marched by our side, sharing with us danger and privation. Conrad, comrades who have grown as dear to us as brothers lie dotting the steep hillside. Their battles ended, their warfare over. Nevermore will they press with us shoulder to shoulder as the bristling steel points sweep resistlessly on. Nevermore in our hours of glee will their voices join in the merry jest or fill the air with laughter. They are gone. And the everlasting mountains in the shadows of which they lie shall be their eternal monument. Year after year, the forest trees will shed their crowns of glory over them. And day by day, as the winds sigh through the Brentwood Hills, they will chant a low, sad requiem to their memory. So yes, it is with gratitude and humility that we come today to this place to dedicate this marker. But it is the preservation of this sacred place that must remain our focus to honor the history enacted on its bosoms. So with that, I would like to introduce my good friend John Allen. And in an astonishing admission, I will be brief. I'm John Allen. I'm president of the Battle of National Preservation Society.
from an historical standpoint, uh, we have it, it's uh, quite an opportunity because we are here today in weather which is almost identical to the weather that. Uh, can you hear me? The folks in the back uh, are making deaf signs. We have weather almost identical to the the weather that was here on December 16th, 1864. Rainy, cold. Uh, I'm sure that with no with, with no effort whatsoever, we'll be able to kick up a good crop of mud to wallow in if anybody wants to. But this is what our ancestors, both north and south, faced that day, uh, and fought their battle for the possession of this hill. Now. I will be followed by Ann Topovich, who is the Executive Director of the Tennessee Historical Society, who will make a few remarks, and hopefully better, are you hearing me now? Okay, a little bit better than, than I've been able to. Thank you. One second. Uh, I serve not only as the Director of the Tennessee Historical Society, but also as a member of the Tennessee Civil War Sesquicentennial Commission. And I know that several of you, all of you, I guess, were at the symposium in Franklin on Friday and received a welcome there, but we are happy to have you uh, here again today. History records not only the glory of war, but the folly of war. The folly of Paris stealing Helen led to Achilles before the walls of Troy. The folly of the fire eaters of the South breaking the Union led to the American Civil War, and the desperate folly of John Bell Hood led to the tragic deaths on this battlefield. We are here this afternoon to memorialize the sacrifice of the Minnesota troops who fought in the Battle of Nashville and to acknowledge, too, the sacrifice of their adversaries from the South. As we stand under this weeping sky today, I'm mindful of this poem by the great Civil War poet Walt Whitman, reconciliation, word over all, beautiful as the sky, beautiful that war and all its deeds of courage must in time be utterly lost, that the hands of the sisters of death and night incessantly, softly wash again and ever again this soiled world. For my enemy is dead, a man as divine as myself is dead. I look where he lies, white-faced and still in the coffin. I draw near, bend down, and touch lightly with my lips the white face in the coffin. Let us remember the sacrifices of these men today. Next, I'd like to introduce the Honorable uh, Representative uh, Dean Erdahl. Dean is the co-chair of our Commemorative Task Force. Uh, Dean has been a, was a history teacher for 35 years, and he's the author of several books, especially on the Dakota War uh, that took place at the same time as the Civil War in uh, Minnesota, and he's been a state representative. He was the, uh, uh, the chair of the Legacy Committee, which we have in Minnesota, and Dean was very instrumental in putting together the task force that we have and also the funds we've had to do the many wonderful events we've done over the last few years. Dean? Well, thank you. Great to be here today. Uh, appreciate the warm welcome of the uh, folks here in Tennessee and not necessarily the warm weather, but we're kind of used to this. <coughs> I bring you greetings from Minnesota <coughs> Secretary of State Mark Ritchie and Governor Mark Dayton. I'm honored to be here in Nashville today to help dedicate the marker commemorating the exploits and courage of those in the four Minnesota regiments who battled here. We also remember today the Army of Tennessee for their valor. The Great American Civil War is a seminal moment in our history. Our time as a nation is measured up to and from that point. We are here to observe a critical moment in that war and remember those involved in it. Names of famous generals like George Thomas and John Bell Hood are forever linked with what happened here in December of 1864. We know that the 10th, 9th, 5th, and 7th Minnesota regiments made a dramatic charge up Shy's Hill. 
But as Ken was indicating earlier, you know, who were these boys from Minnesota who traveled thousands of miles in the war to find themselves at the climactic Battle of Nashville? The regiments had much in common. I'd like to focus on one company in the 5th Regiment and on one man. Most companies came from a particular geographic region. Of the 88 men mustered into Company B of the 5th, all but 11 came from Dodge or Fillmore counties in southeastern Minnesota. 60 of them were farmers, most were young, 18 were 20 or younger, 7 in their 30s, 12 in their 40s, 4 had gray hair, and the rest in their 20s. The average height was 5 foot 9. One was a native Minnesotan. One third were foreign born. Most all were new to the new state of Minnesota. Jimmy Dunn was really 18 when he enlisted, but he put down 21. A native of Chatfield, but born in Canada, he farmed some, he clerked in his father's hotel, and he dreamed of saving the Union. The fifth was said was the last to be mustered in under Lincoln's first call for troops. Jimmy expected to be sent south to fight, but in the spring of 1862, three companies of Company of the Fifth were left behind to garrison three frontier forts in Minnesota to assist immigrant settlers and to maintain the peace. That seemed easy because there had never been a problem with the Dakota Indians in Minnesota. Jimmy and his comrades chafed at the useless duty as a waste of time. To lessen the boredom of life at Fort Ridgely, Jimmy learned how to fire artillery pieces. Margaret Hearn, a woman at the fort, remembered him as a soldier who always helped us about our work. Ben Randall warmly recalled, he was brave and courageous. His merry laugh dried the tears of many a sorrowing woman. His comical expressions would ring out whenever the Indian bullets splintered the, ca the carriage or flattened on the gun. The latter refers to the fact that peace in Minnesota was shattered in the summer of 1862, when war between the Dakota and whites broke out. On the first day of the war, Captain Marsh led 46 men, including Jimmy Dunn, to Redwood Ferry to investigate stories of an outbreak there. Company B was ambushed. Sergeant John Bishop found himself face to face with a Dakota warrior. Both men fired and both men missed. Each attempted to reload, but the Dakota was quicker. As Bishop was still ramming his charge, the Indian aimed his weapon. Bishop felt his left arm rise as a rifle barrel emerged under his armpit. The rifle fired. The Dakota fell. Jimmy Dunn from behind Bishop simply said, you lead, my gun's empty. Together, they followed Marsh in retreat. In desperation, Marsh suggested they cross over the Minnesota River. The captain went in first to test the depth. When strong currents pulled him down, Jimmy Dunn dived in to attempt a rescue. He was unsuccess unsuccessful, and Marsh drowned. Dunn fought valiantly at Fort Ridgely on a gun crew, and the Dakota were repelled. After the six-week war, Company B was sent south to join the other seven companies of the 5th. Jimmy, with the 5th, took part in 13 campaigns and dozens of battles and engagements, including Minnesota's bloodiest days here at Nashville. Late in the afternoon of December 16, 1864, Minnesota troops charged up Shy's Hill and across a cornfield. Tom Gear captured a Confederate flag and was awarded the Medal of Honor for his deed. John Bishop captured a Confederate general. And Jimmy Dunn, he didn't hesitate as he raced across the cornfield until a mini ball struck him down. He died in Nashville and lies in your cemetery today. And we visited his marker today. Jimmy Dunn's gone. They are all gone. But they live on in the hearts and minds of those who remember. As long as we value devotion to a cause, as long as we treasure courage, glory, and selflessness, those who struggled here, blue and gray, will always be with us. Always.
Okay. <clears throat> Mr. Mike is back. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, as our keynote speaker today, uh, Jim Kay, uh, who is the former president of the Battle of National Preservation Society, and I believe is impersonating a Confederate brigadier at this very moment. Uh, Jim, will you come forward? I think he's impersonating Frank Sheetham, but I'm not positive. You want to take a moment to stretch, stand up and stretch? You're good. Okay. Welcome our northern friends to the great state of Tennessee. My name is Jim Kay. I'm a Nashville native. I have been coming to this hill since 1966, as have many other Nashvillians that have been coming here since 1866. Where you stand today is, in Civil War terms, sacred ground. This is Compton's Hill. It later became Shy's Hill after Colonel Shy, the Colonel of the 20th Tennessee, was killed in action on top of the hill. Benton Smith Road, here to my right and your left, is named after General Thomas Benton Smith, who is an officer in his 20s, was struck down by a United States officer with a saber after the battle and was taken to Nashville with a bleeding head and his brain <laughs> oozing out and he didn't die until the 1920s in a mental asylum in Nashville. All of these roads around here are named for Confederate generals. This place knows no time. It is the most sacred site in Nashville for the Civil War. It is important, it is fantastic, and it is worth talking about today. There's some people here that have saved this lot with me and invested heavily in it. And uh, my friends from the Battle of Nashville Preservation Society, John Allen, Jim Atkinson, Sidney McAllister, Philip Dewar, Tom Lawrence. We have partners with the Tennessee Historical Society, Ann Topovich, that just spoke. They own the top of the hill. The developer was kind enough and smart enough in 1954 to save the top of the hill. Our government, unfortunately, put a water tower on it in the 60s. It's now been removed and reestablished to where it, it needs to be. Tim Walker, to my right, from Metro Historical, is also a great friend and partner of ours. I need to mention my wife. She's standing right here in front of me. Her name's Elaine because she has been a part of this crazy um, part of my life, which has been really my entire life, supporting Civil War sites and this site and uh, the house next door that uh, she and I own together. She's been important. Thanks. Okay, let's talk about why we're here. Wow, December 15th, 1864, the Confederate line about a mile and a half from here gets completely routed. General Hood is on top of this hill all day, most of the day, December 15th. He's got a panoramic view of the disaster that's unfolding against him. He's risked it all here. We don't like General Hood being from the South. How Texas would name a fort after him at Fort Hood is still uh, bizarre to us. How Fort Bragg could get its name in North Carolina for that moron <laughs> is uh, equally amazing. <laughs> Nevertheless, General Hood was on top of this hill, and late in the evening the Texans under Ector's brigade were on the hill, and he said, men, I need you to hold this hill at all hazards. They said, we'll do it, General. Unfortunately, later in the day on the 16th, they weren't on this hill. They were sent to the southeast to protect the U.S. cavalry to stop the U.S. Cavalry coming across Granny White Pike. The Confederates arrived here late in the evening. How's my sound? Am I too loud up front? Am I okay and back? Late in the evening, December 15, 1864, the Cheatham's Division arrives here. 
and Finley's Florida Brigade digs in where we are, some of the trenches you can see 30 yards north of the Minnesota Monument. They have about six hours to dig in before sunlight. They've got few tools. They dig ditches as deep as they can get them. They are in rags. They are freezing. They are in the mud. They are miserable. Things are not going well. And they wake up the next morning in the United States Army and the Minnesotans and the Iowans and the New Yorkers and everyone else has lined up parallel to the Confederate line and had you been standing here 15 December 1864 you could see all the way to Interstate 65 where the Confederate line made a turn to the south where it was defended by Stephen Lee's division. Things here from daylight got worse on top of the hill, they realized that they had dug the trenches too far back from the crest of the hill. An engineering blunder, and it was too late to fix it. The United States batteries, at least three, probably 20 guns, opened up on this hill with 1,500 rounds of artillery during the day and blasted it to pieces. The head logs were knocked off the trenches. The trenches were raised for 50 or 60 yards. There was nowhere for these men to go. Things were bad. Rene Beauregard was able to get two Confederate guns right here behind us. This road wasn't here at the time. There was a uh, declivity on the hill and about where the sign is. He got two smoothbore Napoleons there behind ditches and the fire was so hot that they would fire the guns and then pull them with ropes back behind the, the parapet walls where they wouldn't get killed from the incoming fire. The United States batteries were so effective that day that the Confederates, for the most part, kept their heads down and they knew what was coming. They had seen bad battle lines before. They were tested troops. They knew that they were in big trouble. However, they still could have fought another day had General MacArthur not decided on his own whim to state to his troops take that hill. The truth is that MacArthur did that without orders. Had MacArthur waited another day, the entire Confederate Army would have been captured. But MacArthur decided that for whatever reason, and it's easy to be a Monday morning quarterback, that he was going to be the man. He made the, he made the order and the Minnesotans lined up and came up the steep hill in weather similar to this, cold, but it was not quite raining as hard. The Louisiana Point Coupe Battery, 600 yards to the east, inflicted the casualties on the Minnesota troops as they came up the hill. Finley's Floridians had had a tough time at Murfreesboro the week before, and they were in no mood to fight. <laughs> They probably fired one round from their muskets and then quit. Much like the Florida football team on any given Saturday yeah. this fall. And when they ran, everybody else ran. Of the 1,600 troops, mostly Tennesseans on top of the hill, only about 75 or 80 got out alive. The rest were captured and everybody ran this way, down the hill, through the muddy cornfields to try to get over the hill and get away from the U.S. troops. Everyone up here celebrated. It was a great, spectacular United States victory, probably the most decisive battle of the Civil War, and it was over, and they chased Hood to the Tennessee River and then to Corinth, and the war in the West was over. This spot is safe. We have worked so hard to save it. We have worked so hard to keep it clean. We have worked so hard to keep it open for the public. And our fight never ends. When we heard that Minnesota wanted to put a monument here, wow. At first we said no, Ken. <laughs> But after further thought about it and to sanctify the importance of this site, 
We said yes. And what a day. This place is important to Nashville. It's important to America. It is one of the only undisturbed sites in Nashville that still remains. You can come here every year on December 16th at sundown. And you can get a tour and nothing has changed. It is quiet. It is peaceful. It's amazing. And the fact that this lot is worth three or four hundred thousand dollars now matters not. It's protected with our partner, the Land Trust of Tennessee, and it will be here for Americans forever. So in this mess of terrible weather that our friends from Minnesota have brought with them, we are honored beyond words to have you here today. We are honored that you would put your hard-earned money into a monument here. We are honored that you would sit out here in this mess to make this important in your life to dedicate this. In 50 years from now, not one of us will be alive save the child that's in the back with her parents. There will be another group here, hopefully, in this spot, on this spot, and hopefully it will be important to them. But one thing for sure is this hill will be here and it will be protected. Welcome to the South. Thank you very much. Representative McDaniel, would you like to make a few remarks? Or you, you got, was that a, was that a uh, sorry to thank you? Okay. Well, thank you very much. We'll turn it over now to uh, the dedication crew. No, we'd like to, if you could stay up for Jim and Dean, we'd like to make a little dedication. On behalf of uh, our Sesquicentennial Task Force, the state of Minnesota, uh, we'd like to present this to you, Jim, and, and to you, Nashville. Nashville Battlefield Association, the uh, pile painting of the Battle of Nashville. Wow, thank you. I mean, the governor's waiting right now. This, uh, this, uh, the original hangs in the uh, reception room of uh, the governor of Minnesota <laughs> in the state capitol. And if you want to come look at this, look up here on the hill, on the side of the hill, and that is where we sit, sit today. About right up here, you'll see the gun smoke, and that's where we are today. This is a fantastic painting. Thank you very much. Let's set this here with people to see it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, next, we were going to have a commemorative uh, ceremony up by the marker on the hill, but uh, given the weather and talking to Jim, we said, let's get most of that out of the way down here and then we'll go up and uh, we're just gonna put a, uncover the stone and put a wreath on, but for right now, we'll do the first part of our ceremony. So Daryl and uh, Tom, could you uh, gentlemen come up here and maybe grab a space? And uh, what we're going to do in a moment is read the names of the Minnesotans who died here on Shies Hill. Uh, there's always a debate about how many numbers that uh, comes to, but we think there were like 98 Minnesotans that died that day. There were 302 casualties uh, in total, and that was uh, the, the number of killed was almost one third of all the Union soldiers killed on that day. So. Uh, but I'd like to say as, as a token of remembrance, this is part of the ceremony that we were going to have, but as a token of remembrance on this historical occasion, we'd like to take a moment to recite the names and remember the brave Minnesota men who fought and died here at Nashville. Let us cherish their example as patriots and defenders of their principles, the principles they believe to be right. Let us not forget their sacrifice or that of all the brave soldiers who have given their lives here in cause of freedom.
I'm Daryl Sanis, and this is Thomas Helfelfinger. We're both with the Minnesota Civil War Commemorative Task Force. Please bear with us for a few moments. We're going to read the names of all the men who were killed here. I'm going to start with the men that were killed. I'm going to start with a few of the men that were killed on day one on December 15th. They were killed at readout number three and number four. Private Fred Fessenden, Captain Henry Stassen, Private Daniel Eddy, Private Eli Bertrand, Private Samuel Prentice, Private George Abbott, and then those killed on the second day, December 16th, from the 5th Minnesota Infantry Regiment. These men were killed in the cornfield just west of Granny White Pike. Private James Dunn, Private William Everett, Corporal John Irish, Sergeant Plasky Miller, Private John Coley, Private J.W. Douglas, Private Peter Eichelberger, Private Willard Woodward, Private Hanley Bartley, Private John Battles, Corporal Horace Beach, Private Wilmot Pennock, Private Lars Torkelson, Sergeant William Young, Private Nicholas Angelsberg, First Lieutenant Henry Bailey, Private Nelson Roberge, Corporal Christian Wolfe, Private Killian Barberich, Private Patrick Burns, Private Adelaide Lefebvre, Private Thomas Cramp, Private Daniel Glenn, Private Jacob Jangles, Private Michael LeHay, Private Jeremiah Ryan, Private Andrew Stramberg, Private Frederick Penrod, Private Ole Peterson, Private Lasias Raymond, Private Christopher Richter, Sergeant Henry Bass, Private Frank Schleichter, Private Christian Schultz, Private Nicholas Schultz. And from the 7th Minnesota Volunteer Infantry, these men were killed south of Bradford House, just east of the Granny White Pike. Corporal Napoleon Chamberlain, Private Martin Oliver, Private George Simons, Private Benjamin Schaffner, Private Milton Burns, Private Peter Hansen, Private Sebastian Volley, Private Jacob Hamlin, Private Joseph Fadden, Private David Coolidge, and Corporal Archibald Savage. I have the honor of reading the names of the men who perished on the hillside to your right. On December 16, 1864, from the 9th Minnesota Volunteers on the north slope of Shides Hill, Private Alexander Rice, Corporate F.M. Harrington, Private Michael Cluck, Private Adele Wilcox, Private John Bergink, Private John Burke, Captain Askrim Scarrow, Private James Cleary, Second Lieutenant John R. Roberts, Private John Houston, Private William Wallace, Private George C. Gay, Private John Brown, Private Stefan Demers, Private William T. Henry, Private Thomas Kennedy, Private Dennis O'Laughlin, and Corporal Joseph Webster. Also on the 16th, members of the 10th Minnesota Volunteers who died on the northwest angle of Shies Hill, Corporate John G. Maracal, Corporal, Corporal Austin Carroll, Sergeant Charles Dowley, Private Alman Dake, Private Eusebius Mullins, Corporal John W. Murphy, Private Christ Nelson, Private Nathan Putnam, Private Frank Griffin, Private George Lumsden, Private Ole Nelson, Private George Reeves, Private James Ryan, Private Stengru Benson, Private Frederick Chamberlain, Private Jesse Ferguson, Private Charles Fleming, Private Theodore Hacker, Private Hans Olesen, Private John Kopertz, Corporal Henry Vosterling, Private John Duff, Corporal Daniel Brocken, Private Michael McManon, 
Major Michael Cook and Captain George White. So let us remember that these men were, so, were then so as they are now in the hands of the Heavenly Father. Let us also give also then remember those honored dead who did not return but lie in resting places known only to God. In the rising of the sun and its going down, in the blowing of the wind in the chill of winter, in the opening of buds and in the rebirth of spring, in the blueness of the skies and in the warmth of summer, in the rustling of the leaves and in the beauty of the autumn, in the beginning of the year and when it ends, we shall remember them. So long as we live, they too shall live, for they are a part of us. With that, we'd, we'd like to invite you uh, up onto the hill if you wish to. We uh, are going to uh, uh, uncover the uh, marker and place a wreath there. And very, very slick. Very okay. Slick ice. Yeah. So as Jim said, it's very, very slick. So if you just want to uh, view up the hill, that's just fine. That's uh, we, we don't want anyone to go up there and, and get injured. So it's dangerous. Yes. So uh, be forewarned. So thank you.